Okay, so welcome to this video. In this video, what we're going to do is discuss uh, methods for uh, producing protein uh, for analytical research, basically. So, here's the setup. You want, you want a some to make some protein. You want to have some purified protein so that you can do analytical research on that protein. How do you get it, basically? How do you get your hands on this protein? And basically there are two methods which I'm going to talk about in this video. One is that you go to some starting material, basically. So let's say you're investigating a protein that uh, is within the blood. Then you might and get some blood, I don't know, some pig's blood or something. Uh, you uh, Say you're investigating a protein that's expressed in flies, you might get some flies. Uh, if you're investigating a protein that's expressed in leaves of, of plants, you'll get leaves of plants, basically. So you start off with a starting material that contains your protein. This is one way to do it. This is quite an inefficient, um, a, a, an inefficient way of doing it because, uh, as you'll see, you'll have you'll have to start off with a lot of starting material to get your hands on a, on, the amount of pro on a certain amount of protein that you want. And you're going to end up with a lot of waste that you're somehow going to have to extract your uh, protein from. So basically we're going to discuss a better way of doing it than this, but you could start off with a starting material. So uh, an example is blood, um, whole organisms like poor flies, uh, and um, leaves, maybe. Okay, so you start off with some biological material, and basically you put it in a, uh, a homogenizer, which basically uh, is, if you've got a smoothie maker, it's effectively the same thing as that. So you put it in a homogenator, uh, homogenizer, sorry, uh, which basically is going to mush this up into shreds. So it's got like a... Um, it's got like a sort of blade there and it spins around and round and round and round and round and round and makes it into like what well makes if you put in loads of fruit into here it makes you a smoothie, but if you put flies in it's going to make you a brown mush. Okay, so you basically homogenize your starting material. Homogenize uh Okay, uh, so you end up with now a mush that contains the protein of interest then. Okay, so now uh Basically, the idea with the homogenization is that it's going to break down all the cell membranes. So, in your starting material, you have lots and lots of cells. Whereas, basically, once you've homogenized it, the idea is that all the cells have been broken up and smashed up into pieces. Obviously, there'll be some whole cells left in here, but some of them will have been smashed up into pieces. And now the protein that was inside those cells, maybe, or, if you know, if it's blood, then the protein might be free in the blood. Uh, but... Uh, if it's if it's like a protein that's intracellular, then the idea of homogenization is that it's going to blast the cells apart, basically. Okay, so you can homogenize uh, your starting material, and now in that homogenate, uh, you have the protein freely suspended in that homogenate. Okay, so somehow what we now need to do is separate the protein from all the other things that are in here. So there's sugars in here, there is uh, lipids in here, there is all sorts in there. And you want to separate the protein from the homogenate, uh, from, the, uh, from the rest of the contents of the homogenate. And the way in which you do this is you ultra centrifuge it. So you put it in a centrifuge. Okay, so what is a centrifuge? Basically, a centrifuge is a test tube, which uh, which you put. Well, it's uh, sorry, it's a machine that you put a test tube into. So let's say here is the machine that you put the test tube into, and what the machine will do is it will spin the test tube round and round and round really, really fast. So um, you're going to spin the tube round and round and round. So basically, you put your homogenate into uh, the tube, so here is the homogenate in the tube, and then uh, the centrifuge spins the tube round and round and round and round. And basically, if you think about what's happening in that tube now, you have absolutely loads of stuff in that tube that's in the homogenate. So somewhere there'll be proteins, so let's say this is our protein that we want to extract. Now, proteins have a very, very high density. They are a dense molecule, whereas there'll be a lot of water molecules in there, which are very, very tiny mass molecules. Okay, so basically what, a uh, what, what happens when you centrifuge is that bigger 
heavier particles with more inertia are going to be pushed to the side of the test tube because they're going to feel what's known as a greater centrifugal force. But the centrifugal force is a misnomer. There is no such thing as the centrifugal force. It, what it is, is inertia. Everything in our universe obeys Newton's first law, we think anyway, which is that if you have a ball in, and then nothing else in the universe, and you set that ball moving, then it will just continue moving in the same at the same in the same direction at the same speed forever. And in some sense, if you know the theory of relativity, it's not moving at all really. Uh, but in relative to itself, it's stationary. You know, all the reference frames are equivalent. But basically, Newton's first law says that. Um, uh, things want to remain inertial. They don't want to change their speed, and they want to stay in the same direction. If you put uh, this particle into this centrifuge, then it is going to have to go round and round in a circle, basically. And it doesn't like doing that. It wants to, you know, it wants to go off here. Uh, so um, what happens is that the particle ends up pushed against the outside of the test tube, and that force pushing it outside of the test tube is what's known as the centrifugal force. But as I say, it's not a force, really. It's just the particle's will to go in a straight line that it doesn't actually want to go round in a circle. So basically, it's being pushed against the wall of the test tube. If this is the wall of the test tube here, as the test tube goes round and round, the particle is going to try and push this way, but obviously the test tube will keep it in, and it will push it round like that. Now, um, bigger particles have more inertia. That which means that their will to not change direction is greater. It's more difficult to make a particle uh, with a greater mass change direction, basically. Uh, so, uh, the particles which are going to be thrown out to the outside are going to be those particles with large mass, and particles with smaller mass will remain on the inside of the test tube, basically going round and round, because they are, they will change direction more easily, basically, and they will have their direction changed, basically, by the rest of the fluid, basically. So, what you get if you do this centrifuge is you get that larger molecules are thrown out to the outside and smaller molecules remain more in the middle. Now, water is an extremely small molecule, so it's going to remain in the middle. So, what you're going to get is protein being thrown out to the outside, and now there's not any water molecules out there. So you're, you've, the protein is basically going to come out of suspension. It's going to, and then uh, it's going to become basically a solid. And um, then what's going to happen is gravity is going to act and pull it downwards. So what happens is you get all of these protein molecules pushed against the outside. They separate from water because water remains in the middle, and then they slide down the edge of the test tube to the bottom and form basically a pellet at the bottom. Okay, uh, so um, and the f uh, so if you centrifuge, you'll homogenate. What you'll get is a pellet forming at the bottom, and that is a protein pellet. And you can uh, you can set the speed of this centrifuge perfectly so that the only stuff that's in this pellet will be a pr will be protein basically. So you get this protein pellet at the uh, bottom of your test tube, and the fluid that is still remaining. Uh, above the pellet is then called the supernatant. Okay, so the stuff that's remained in suspension basically is called the supernatant. So what you do is you let your is you put your test tube containing your homogenate into this centrifuge. It spins it around. You get uh, a pellet forming apart from the centrifuge, and then you take your test tube out of the centrifuge. And what you do is you take some sort of pipette and uh, remove. Uh, this supernatant without disturbing the pellet. So you remove the supernatant, and what you end up with basically is a pellet of protein at the bottom. Now, we still have a problem. We might have separated the protein from other molecules like sugars and uh, lipids and things, but we have loads and loads of protein in this pellet. And we just wanted one type of protein, but how do we know that there's not absolutely loads of different types? of proteins in this pellet. So we still now have the process of purification to go through, but at least now what we have is a pellet of protein uh, which we can uh, which we can go further with. And in the next video what we'll do is we'll uh, go over how what we do next after this, what we um uh, what we um you know how we go from a pellet of protein to our actual desired protein. Okay, right. Now what I want to talk about is a better way of doing this. 
um, because using this starting material, such as blood, flies, leaves, just biological material which we believe our desired protein is expressed within, that's extremely inefficient. And the reason is that, for one, these biological materials might only express tiny amounts of our actually desired protein. For two, uh, they, can, they will express loads of different types of protein, potentially much higher, um, higher amounts than they express the desired protein. So this protein pellet is probably going to be nearly all uh, different proteins that we don't want, basically, we're not interested in. Uh, in addition, you know, it's, um, it's not nice to have to homogenize flies, um, and it, you, you might end up having to process huge amounts of starting material to even get a measurable amount of your actual protein, and, you know, that's time-consuming, consuming. it's not a nice job, uh, so we want a better way of doing this. And there is a better way of doing this. So this is the way you have to do it if you are actually looking for some protein that has never ever been discovered before, basically. You have to do it like this. Um, but if you have got a protein that's, that someone has done this for before, then what you can do is, let's say they've done this experiment on flies, they found this protein in flies, what will have then happened is they'll have done loads of analytical research and they will have found the gene in the fly genome which codes for that protein in flies. So the fly protein uh, is encoded for by a gene in the fly's genome. So they will have sequenced this gene and they will know what the sequence of, you know, what the sequence of organic bases is. Right, now let's say what you want to do is you want to, um, you want to find this protein in humans. What you can do is you can go online, you can go to a genome database of the human genome, because the human genome has now been completely sequenced. So what you over here, what have I done there? Database. So you can go online to this human genome database, you can take this gene that we know the sequence of from flies, you can stick it into the human genome database, and what it will do is it will look for genes, uh, it will look for sequence, you know, or look for pieces of the human genome that are very, very similar to this gene in flies. Uh, so what it's going to do is it's going to look for, uh, for genes that are very much so similar in the human genome to this gene in flies. And basically it might find you, let's say, an 80% match, and then you have a pretty good hope that that gene will code for the analogous protein in humans, basically. Okay, yes, it might not be exactly the same sequence of organic bases, uh, but it's going to be so close that it's probably going to be the same protein. So what you then do is you, you know, the genome database will tell you where to find this gene in the human genome. You'll then cut that gene out of the human genome, and you'll stick it into an expression vector, basically, such as a plasmid. So, uh, we've discussed um, how we can uh, you use, um, we've discussed in vivo gene cloning in an earlier video in this Placed on Experimental Techniques. So, what you do, basically, is you'll, f let me draw a picture just to remind you of in vivo gene cloning. So, um, you will uh, have your gene here. So you've gone onto this human genome database and you've found this analogous gene in the human genome to the gene in flies, which codes for your protein in flies. Okay, so he, let's say it is here. This is the gene in, hu in the human genome that we now want to make the protein from. So what we can do is uh, we can uh, cut it out with restriction endonucleases. So we'll find uh, some restriction site above here, uh, um, you know, upstream of the gene, and some restriction site downstream of the gene. So let me highlight those in. So let's say this is a restriction site here. Okay, and it, for argument's sake, let's say it's the restriction site for the ECOR1 restriction enzyme. So G-A-A-T-T-C-C-T-T. Uh, a A G and then the same one down here G A A T T C uh, C T T A A G. So we've got two restriction sites for the restriction enzyme ECO R1. And this enzyme will come and it will cut uh, these uh, pieces of DNA like so. It will cut them so that you get sticky ends basically, these overhangs of four nucleotides. Okay, so now what you have is you have this piece of DNA here, if I draw it on here like so, and there, you have this piece of DNA, 
uh, which we're going to insert into our expression vector. And a plasmid is an example of an expression vector. So we're going to take this piece of DNA out. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a bacterial plasmid, like so. It will have a similar, it might have a similar one of these restriction sites in, basically. So let's say it has a, um, a GAA, TTC, CTT, AAG site. So it has a restriction site for this EcoR1 enzyme. And this EcoR1 enzyme will therefore cut it similarly. So the plasmid will now be cut into a linear piece of DNA. So what you're going to end up with is something like this. Uh, like so. Okay, and then what you do is you take this pink piece of DNA and stick it in there. So you've put your human gene into your bacterial plasmid. And, um, and then what you do is you put this plasmid into bacteria. And if you uh, want to see a more in detailed um, discussion of this, I advise you to uh, watch my video on uh, in vivo gene cloning. But briefly what you do is um, you uh, expose the bacteria to high levels of calcium in order that the calcium neutralizes uh, the negative charge on the heads of the phospholipids. So the bacterial membrane is a phospholipid by there, so uh, it's made up of phospholipids. And phospholipids basically have phosphate heads, which are negatively charged groups. Uh, so the outside, the outer surface of the membrane basically is negatively charged. If you, however, expose this to high levels of calcium, the calcium will bind to these negative charges on the heads of the phospholipids and will neutralize the outer aspect of the membrane. Okay, now the reason we need to do that is because DNA also has phosphate groups in it. Uh, DNA has this phosphate, uh, the sugar phosphate backbone, uh, which uh, has lots of phosphate groups which are negatively charged. So DNA is a negatively charged molecule. So how are we going to get it through uh, a membrane which is negatively charged as well? Uh, well, we've neutralized it now so the DNA can get close. Then what we do is we heat up the preparation in order to disturb the membrane enough because you know heating up means that molecules are going to move around more so uh, we believe that heating up the cells uh, to about 42 degrees which is known as heat shock uh, leads to um, leads to holes forming in the membrane and that allows this um, this recombinant plasmid or this recombinant expression vector to enter the cell so now what we have is bacteria uh, which express this recombinant plasmid and have our gene in there. Now, what's going to happen is, in in vivo gene cloning, we looked at this as a mechanism for cloning DNA, i.e. the bacteria will copy this plasmid many, many times, and you know, you then have bacterial bacteria filled with plasmids which contain your gene. But what also happens is the bacteria actually uh, use the gene to make protein from it. So they're going to transcribe it and then translate it. So these uh, transformed bacteria with this recombinant gene in are going to make more, are going to make loads and loads of your protein uh, for which this gene codes. So these bacterial cells are going to fill up with this protein uh, which corresponds to this gene. Okay, and that's highly convenient because now what we've got is bacteria absolutely full of this protein that we wanted them to make. So what we now use, instead of using our, our starting material such as flies, blood or leaves, what we use instead is these bacteria that are filled with our desired protein. So instead of homogenizing flies, blood or leaves, we instead homogenize these bacteria which are actually filled with our desired protein. And that's a more efficient way of doing it because now there's a, a, you know, there's a very high expression of our protein, so much more of this protein pellet is going to actually be our desired protein, and we're going to have to process a lot less starting material than we would if we'd use the material from nature. Okay, so that's the more modern approach to actually um, producing proteins that you want to then uh, analyze. Okay, um, but as I say, if you don't have a clue what protein you're looking for, then you do have to go back to this, okay, the protein's going to be expressed in this leaf. I need to therefore homogen homogenize this leaf and extract that protein from the leaf. 